if you build a ship out of steel, if you don't know anything about scientific principles and it weighs several tons, when you put it in the water, you'd think it'd sink, right? But because of the surface area, it floats. What we're doing is we're thinking too linearly, too simply about, oh yeah, I just do these, the big three lifts right? The big three. So what I would say as opposed to the big three lift, you want to change it to the big, the, the first four movement patterns, as opposed to saying these big lifts, you want to think these four movement patterns, standing, walking, running, and throwing, and then you will have a derivative of a variation of movements from there, which, which lead to sustainable benefits rather than just muscle gain. Right. What type of muscle gain is that muscle, quote unquote, functional? Does that muscle not cause specific types of joint compression? Does that muscle increase my movement potential? Does it increase my movement variability or does it limit it? Right. If my back's thrown out, then my movement variability is limited because the fitness novelty machine will just say, hey, just do what works for you. Do, you know, if, if yoga, you like yoga, just do it. If you like deadlifting and powerlifting and that's your sport, just do it. Never mind the fact that the person that just threw their back out has a rib cage and hip shift that's like, you know, however, however far. And then, or that the person that's done all this yoga is like kind of a floppy mess. This is Decentralized Radio. I'm Tristan. And I'm Ryan. The goal of this podcast is to help educate you on how to live your most optimal life. We will host industry expert guests to shed light on topics that matter. We are not gurus, rather two individuals who have had to pave their own path to health and vitality, independent of the centralized systems that plague modern society. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Decentralized Radio. Today, we have Mike Musiolo on the line, who's a functional patterns practitioner and owner of Functional Patterns Santa Monica. I think I remember that correctly. Mike. That's right. Welcome on board. How's it going? Hey, it's going great. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, this is really cool because this is something I've kind of discovered more recently. Uh, a couple friends have been chatting about, and then I just, yeah, saw. I actually think it was Ryan Carter, Liv Vite, who reposted something of yours. And I was like, uh-huh. oh, this looks right. awesome. And I'm going to reach out and talk more about this because it seems to be a growing thing. Um, and I definitely want to get into kind of, yeah, the differences between what functional patterns is and compared to other functional movements out there and the whole lot of why the gym bro culture maybe isn't the best way to go but I guess before we get into that fun stuff what's kind of your background how did you get into just I guess movement um practice like being a movement practitioner in general and just being into exercise and and health in, in kind of a holistic sense I appreciate that. Um, Yeah, definitely my background and journey is definitely important in terms of how I came to functional patterns because my what what it was is I was in New York and I was studying, uh, you know, theater and acting and stuff like that. A lot of people do that before they end up in the training game, especially L.A. and New York City. So, you know, I, I don't talk about it much because it was something that you know, just led me to where I am. And now I consider this to be my life's work. So, you know, that's just, I kind of have blocked the rest of that out. Um, But it does inform the fact that I was working in the restaurant business for a long time. And all of my stuff was just, hey, I'm into fitness. I like doing it. I could imagine myself coaching others. I also saw the idea of the development of myself as you coach others, then you are developing yourself by doing it for them, you're doing it for yourself. So I saw that aspect. And, you know, one of my friends had worked at Equinox, and he was in always in very, 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 very good shape. So I was inspired by him. He ended up getting me an interview because at that point it was pretty saturated. So it was a little bit tougher to kind of get in there. Um, and luckily enough, you know, I ended up starting there. And once I had done that, it was in Columbus Circle, New York City. And, you know, to be clear that it was great. Um, you know, I, I learned a lot initially and was exposed to many different ideas. And it was where they had a T-Rex uh, 
uh, kind of where it was like their highest level trainers were there, the master teachers of their courses and their curriculum were there. So I felt very lucky to be at that location, even though it didn't, you know, obviously didn't work out long term. Um, I would still say I had a very positive experience for my first couple of years at Equinox for sure. I'm still grateful for that experience. And then what ended up happening was I was already just more drawn to the functional movement space. I don't know if you guys have seen the Vipers through the Institute of Motion. Um, I had a mentor that was really into that, very involved with them. And I, and I loved working with her. She was fantastic. Um, and then one day I found a clip of Naudi Aguilar, the creator of Functional Patterns. And this was when he was, you know, still, you know, he's still intense. So let that be known. And it, it was what I was immediately attracted to him about that. So I, I say that positively. I guess maybe some people may view that negatively, but I say that positively. I admired his intensity immediately. And he was like, guys, if you... It is not hard. There's a contralateral reciprocation. And this is him mostly talking to the industry. It's not like he's talking to the consumer. He knows that they don't know. But he's like, you put one foot in front of the other, one arm swings, right? It's contralateral reciprocation. And your joints will respond accordingly. And how well and how efficiently those joints respond when that's happening is what matters the most. And, I, and I, so I took it to my mentor and I said, hey, what do you think about what this guy's saying? And she was like, well, you know, he's, he, he's right. And I said, well, he's right. Then what are we doing if he's right? You know, because on his page, it was like, don't stretch, don't deadlift, don't bench press, don't clean, don't do CrossFit. And I was like, well, that makes sense to me. I had been done with that stuff for quite a while. So I was like, OK. And, and, you know, just like what you guys were talking about, you're talking about that guy that was that started sprinting on the beach, your friend in L.A. And he's already like, ah, you know what? I'm done with the gym. I'm just going to do calisthenics. I'm going to stop loading my spine. I'm going to stop, you know, feel I, I, you know, I feel the compression afterwards. I've seen other people get injured. Right. I have this funny statistics where I'm like, you know, three out of every five of your friends have injured themselves deadlifting for a reason. Right. It's because it's not good for you. Um, so, you know, you just, well, oh, your back's out, blah, blah, blah. You know, OK, well, I wonder why you deadlifting. What a surprise. So. Anyway, um, then then she backpedaled because I was like, if he's if he's right, then what are we doing? And she backpedaled and she was like, well, if you know, he, it's exclusive, you know, he's not right about everything, blah, 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 blah. So I was like, all right, well, then that piqued my interest. And then I noticed that no one was certified in it. And I was like, either this is going to be horrible or. What I more likely think it is is what this guy is th saying really makes sense. It goes against what these other people are doing, and they don't like that. So I was like, all right, I'm, yeah, well, I'm just attracted to that immediately. And so then from there, then I, I took the Human Foundations course, and I once I did the course, I came back from New York City, and I was lucky enough to where I had built enough seniority to where as long as my clients were on board and I was still having new clients when that was appropriate, my fitness managers were totally cool with that. And maybe initially if I tried to walk in with that, they would have been like, no, you can't do that. But then they actually thought it was kind of interesting. So they, they kind of allowed me to do that and change most of my program for everyone that was willing. So that's how I came to becoming a practitioner. That's cool, man. It's really interesting diving into this stuff because I've, I've, I've seen, I mean, actually the, this type of movement idea came to me. Uh, I think I was like scrolling on TikTok, um, actually. And I saw this guy just like throwing this mace around basically with this heavy weighted ball in the end and doing all these movements. And then I started like sort of looking into it and I had made some friends in, in sort of the funny mentioned you started out as acting and that's why you went to LA. That's exactly why I was there for a long time. But, uh, but it's, it's pretty interesting how you, your paths change a little bit. Um, but as I started, sort of started digging into it, I did sort of make that correlation between what you do in the gym and what the human body is functionally made to move like, and the two don't always necessarily correlate. I've noticed like a lot of movements in the gym are very linear up and down, um, like the squat or the deadlift even, or like, I mean, I mean, every movement really is, is pretty linear and basis. I've seen a lot of what you do is very dynamic. There's a lot of muscle groups being activated at once. I've seen a lot of things. Uh, you can see that even the transformations on your page itself, where you can see these muscle imbalances. And I feel like a lot of us, um, through lifestyle, 
through the way we exercise or lack of exercise develop these like inconsistencies in our in our muscle patterns and our movement patterns, and these create the basis of what injury becomes. And so I'd love to sort of dig in with you, maybe what we get wrong in the gym, just looking at it from a gym bro perspective and like why linear thinking in the gym may not be the most uh, longevity focused for fitness. Because I think at the end of the day, everyone wants to reach this point where it's like, okay, I want to be fit, but I want to be fit for a long time. So why may not that be advantageous in the way we currently view gym fitness when we go to the gym like everyone's just squatting deadlifting like you're talking about before what's missing in that a hundred percent and that that's just that's a great way to kick things off because that's exactly what functional patterns is about is that you know in terms of what because you know in marketing there's the problem and then how do you solve the problem and then that is where the consumer comes into play in between that and what we're doing is we're trying to completely reframe the problem as opposed to what we call the fitness novelty machine, which is Jim Bro culture, right? And the fitness novelty machine will say, you know, you want to gain muscle, then you have to lift between 8 to 12 reps and have a certain amount of protein and do these compound lifts, right? So when people talk about the compound lifts, that is Jim Bro science that, you know, makes sense on a surface level, right? So just quickly, you know, I won't go too off on a tangent, but we talk about a book, it's called Tyranny of Words. It was written by Stuart Chase. And some of the concepts that seem intuitive are actually non-intuitive. So it's like, hey, yeah, I just do these big movements that gives me the most muscle fiber recruitment and therefore that will give me the most muscle. And, you know, to an extent, they might, they sort of might be right. Not everyone will build muscle that way, but you are recruiting a certain degree of muscle fibers in comparison to your other options. But like, for example, Stuart Chase says this quote where he says, when, if you build a ship out of steel, if you don't know anything about scientific principles and it's weighs several tons, when you put it in the water, you'd think it'd sink, right? But because of the surface area, it floats. So it's a non-intuitive scientific principle. So this is, what we're doing is we're thinking too linearly, too simply about, oh yeah, I just do these, the big three lifts, right? The big three. So what I would say as opposed to the big three lifts, you want to change it to the big, the, the first four movement patterns, which are, this is reframing the problem, as opposed to saying these big lifts, you want to think these four movement patterns, standing, walking, running, and throwing, and then you will have a derivative of a variation of movements from there. Whereas you could think of the same thing in bodybuilding, I'm going to squat, deadlift, and bench press, perhaps overhead press, and then from there, I'm going to do accessory things like work my triceps, work dips, do pec flies, right, as an accessory. Those are, de- those are kind of de- – or you're working the stabilizing muscles or whatever they want to say now. But what we're saying is that, okay, you don't need to train your deep squat per se. You don't need to train – you know, you don't even need to train running per se. You don't need to train, um, you know, lifting – per se, although there will be specific instances where we put people in that context and see how they do and drill that context. But for the most part, if you take the fundamental mechanisms of these four movement patterns, then you get a downstream effect of positive correlations to your health, which which lead to sustainable benefits rather than just, you know, muscle gain, right? What type of muscle gain? Is that muscle quote unquote functional? Does that muscle not cause specific types of joint compression, right? Does that does that muscle increase my movement potential, right? Does it increase my movement variability or does it limit it, right? If my back's thrown out, then my movement variability is limited. Um, does it include tran- Does it include the fundamental principles that come along with gait mechanics, such as the appropriate transverse rotations, right? The hip and rib reciprocation, right? As humans, we have to look at our biological characteristics, which we are contralateral. We do contra- contralateral oscillation, right, of our femurs and our arms. So, so if that's the case, then if those characteristics aren't included, then we have to reframe the problem and say, hey, listen, it's not just, okay, instead of bodybuilding, do functional bodybuilding. 
no, you actually really have to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, we have to reset the whole thing and change the, the root patterns, change the root movements that we attempt at the gym. Hey, friend. Thanks for listening. If you really enjoy this podcast, it would be really appreciated if you left us a five-star review on Spotify, Apple, or subscribe to our content on YouTube. This helps us get to a larger reach and a larger audience to spread this wonderful free education. Yeah, I think that's why this is so like, I guess, controversial, to be honest, because there's been, you know, mobility and other functional movements, calisthenics, like all these things have become a lot more popular um, because of, yeah, I guess you could say the health longevity of the individual performing it and that you should be more well-rounded in your lifting protocol but what you're saying is basically we need to start from scratch and we need to get back to, I guess, fundamental movements that we would have been doing. And, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot recently and, and I haven't been in a gym since May. And yeah, I, I mostly have just been doing like pull ups and push ups and squats and hiking, but I've also been like swinging a barbell around it. To me, I think especially when I think about like the throwing aspect of the shoulder joint that you mentioned being a foundational movement. We really, I guess, are meant to utilize our joints in their full range of motion throughout that with, you know, some sort of dynamic load. And yeah, I mean, for me right now, if I went to like go throw a baseball or, or if I had a spear, throw a spear, I feel like I'd probably throw my shoulder out. So how do you kind of get into functional patterns? Is there like a, a progressive overload in the beginning? Because we're so disconnected, I guess. And even, you know, I, I have dealt with, you know, patellar tendon issues to where the gym I found was helpful to just rebuild that strength. I'm not talking about like heavy squats, just sure. kind of reloading. So is there still a place for things like that, or can that all be addressed with functional patterns, um, kind of foundational movements? I love that you brought that up because it's great. Ryan kind of brought up kind of the first aspect of it. And then mm -hmm. Tristan, you really piggybacked off that perfectly because what people like to say is that, um, it's really the um, explosion of yoga that has mm. all of a sudden led to, hey, maybe we should think about where we came from, right? And not, not just yoga. I mean, there, there's always been kind of the paleo people, right? They started popularizing the idea of, hey, with the, the, it kind of started with food, Western Price, right? What the Western Price Foundation started talking about, hey, listen, you know, our teeth, the oral facial stuff, we really should consider that we need to be eating more of an ancestral diet, right? And I only put that in quotes as that is correct. I agree with that. But it's just funny to me how when people, like you said, it causes a little bit of controversy with functional patterns, which I understand, because initially it's like, yeah, uh, should you stretch? No. Should you eat what traditionally people should, would consider to be healthy? No. Should you lift? No. Should you run? No, actually. Should you do excessive cardio? No. Then it's like, well, yeah, of course, you know, sounds like you can't do anything. But what you said, I think is really important about a full range of motion. So actually, and, and I know what you mean. You, you're not saying, oh, I should hypermobilize my joints. That's not what you're saying. You're how do I reach the, the, the highest capacity of what my joint is capable of, right? Totally. The thing to remember is that gait gives us a reference point as to what that full range of motion is relative to that person in that moment in time in relationship to the rest of their joints. So that's why we call when people are hypermobile, quote unquote, there's also what we call hyperflaccid, which <laughs> these balloons, do you guys see the balloons? That's been happening to me. I did the live the other day and the balloons pop up, cracks me up. Anyway, anyway. Um, so, so 
um, with the full range of motion, it has to do with nothing is in isolation. So if I try to get a full range of motion out of my shoulder joint by doing kind of like, you know, functional range conditioning likes to do that kind of stuff. And it's like, well, I have to consider what that quote unquote full, we don't want maximum range of motion for the sake of maximum range of motion. That's why a lot of the yoga teachers end up with hip replacements and stuff like that and bit major problems, lower back herniations. It, it has, it typically is mostly in the hips, but if you hypermobilize your shoulders enough, you're going to have neck pain and thoracic issues, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's why when I, as opposed to full range of motion, we like to say integrated range of motion, which is once again, it's kind of buzzy. It doesn't exactly explain what we're doing. However, the way to think about it is every joint has a relationship to another joint. So when you throw something, your hips rotate, your ribs rotate, your your uh, humerus rotates, and then you get a throw, right? But there's a sequencing that happens with that, which is why we do our IMAPs, which is an integrated muscle action potentiation, which is a fancy way of saying we want all the muscles to fire in the way that we want to fire in the correct sequencing at the same time. So when we get that, that is what is allowing us to get a stretch, right? If I, if I flex my bicep, then my tricep stretches. If I do the opposite, then it's vice versa. If I passively stretch my tricep, then I'm not getting a contractile potential on the other side. So then if that's the case, then imagine this on longer myofascial chains. If I'm going to contract my posterior oblique sling, there should be a stretch on my anterior oblique sling and vice versa. So that basic concept is what gives people a quote unquote full range of motion in the way that you're talking about, Tristan. And then I'll just say one more thing, which is where do you get started? It is a little bit less accessible right now, right? You want to, if you are, if you do have a practitioner nearby, you should work with a practitioner. That's what I would say first and foremost. Then, but if you, if you can't yet, then you can do the 10 week course. And I would recommend the 10 week course they've posted on the functional patterns, Instagram about how to set up an in-home setup that is, you know, affordable, budget friendly. So that way you can start with the 10 week course and move your way through the functional training system. And that will at least get you started until we are, you know, are finished with our kind of scaling stuff. No, that's cool. I mean, that all makes sense. I mean, it, it's sort of, I found the same problem within uh, things like physical therapy or, or uh, nursing injury, where it's sort of uh, viewed through a conventional lens of they're looking at the joint or the area of injury or or pain, when a lot of times there's, I mean, I mean, we could talk about like referred pain and stuff like that. A lot of things are, are referred due to other issues, like you said, up the kinetic chain or something like that, whether it's like your lower back could be coming from like your hip or your, or no, speaking of knee issues, for instance, are very common, like could be coming from hip, could be ankle, could be all this stuff. So it's, it's, it's interesting um, how dynamic everything is. And once you sort of look at it through that lens, I think it, it makes sense. It can also become a little more confusing <laughs> because then you're like, okay, what do I need to be looking at? Well, sort of you need to be looking at everything all the time because it's sort of like uh, there's no like A equals B. It's usually like this weird line that kind of goes all over the place. And so when you're like assessing somebody's um, functionality, like what are, what are like basic blocks that you are looking at as far as um, – what you're trying to achieve with somebody like what are like what are a few things that you look at when you start out with someone initially because you mentioned Got mapping uh, and stuff are, like that a hundred percent you were cut off just for a second there i'm assuming the question was you know what are we looking like what do i look for when somebody first comes in yeah. basically yeah Got it. So at Functional Pattern Santa Monica, we start with a postural assessment and a uh, gait assessment. And um, what happens is they come in and we literally take pictures of them just standing there and then they do the gate. Uh, and, you know, of course, you can be intuitive with it, too. And, and that, that's the thing we actually do. And if you 
if you have the first principles, then in some instances, I could literally, I, I do every time I take people through an assessment, but I could literally take someone through an initial movement. And based on that initial movement, you know, I could even have them do a bilateral squat or something like that. I probably wouldn't, but I could. And I would be like, okay, you know, based on what I, I, I get more and more clues as they're moving, as they're working through the session as well. But we do do a, uh, a slow motion capture of their gait from the back and the side, because that tells us most of kind of what we need to know. Um, as long as they can do it, it, we do have some like pretty bad chronic pain cases that are long term, you know, problematic, take a long time to make the right connections, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what I'm looking for, you know, there's the obvious stuff. OK, this person has a lateral hip shift, lateral rib cage shift, you know, your your typical postural dysfunctions, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's, it, it would make sense that something like stretching wouldn't necessarily help that. So, you know, what we're doing is getting those muscles to fire like the primary movers to fire, but not just to fire, to fire in a way that's relative to gait. So the gait cycle gives us clues. And then when I see the, you know, the flaccid tendencies, quote unquote, in somebody's gait cycle, that's what leads us to say, OK, you, you know, it's funny because even if even though people will have idiosyncratic stuff, we typically except for really extreme chronic pain cases, we typically start everybody off at the same place, which is how to even build a standing reference point. You know what I mean? And they go more into that, the 10 week course. That's why the 10 week course starts with myofascial release too, because that myofascial release is a very low risk way of getting the same benefits, especially the feeling of those, that feeling that you have just like stretched or touch your toes or whatever, that same feeling without the harm. Right. So when you do that stretch, it's like the, what I was talking about. Stretching as it's traditionally done is passive. So in many instances, we'll be doing myofascial release to kick off, too. And 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 you'd be surprised. I have had people who are like, yeah, the 10 week course, I did the myofascial release. I didn't even get past week four because I was pretty much pain free after that. And that's usually relative to like where they're at. Right. If they tried to play, you know, hard basketball all of a sudden or do, you know, 50 golf swings at top golf, then, you know, they need a lot of myofascial release afterwards because it's really the movement stuff that solves the problem. Right. That that's what leads people to become pain free as opposed to just the myofascial release. But the myofascial release will initially give people a lot of relief, especially if there's someone who's just like, oh, I've done a ton of weightlifting and I'm just ultra freaking compressed and my ribs don't rotate at all and I have no mobility whatsoever. And really, that's why we're talking about stretching more than anything else. So if there's one thing that I'll say on this podcast is that if you're stretching now, stop stretching. You know, like definitely it's I feel like it's like, man, if someone's done a lot of deadlifting and squat, you know, six weeks max, I'll have them out of lower back pain. No problem. If you if you mess yourself up doing a lot of stretching, mobility work, yoga, Pilates, that kind of stuff. Way, 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 way harder. Way, 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 way harder. So if you want your practitioner's job to be easier, then don't stretch. Stop stretching now and do my fat. Get the 10 week course due to my fascia release instead. I was going to let Tristan jump in, but it's interesting that we were talking about fascia because, like, you can actually see the changes in fascia, like, as you're doing, like, as you mentioned, myofascial release. We talked to um, Carrie B. Wellness, who used to do massage therapy and stuff like that. And she would talk about um, her massage therapy and how it actually, like, it does all this crazy stuff to the fascial tissue. And I think people don't really think about the quality of their fascia as being linked to their pain. That's why it can be such a powerful modality. One thing I was going to ask you about stretching is... I think a lot of people overstretch. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it's – the stretching thing is really fascinating, right? Because yoga has become so popular, right? Like there's, I don't know, 10 studios in every major neighborhood now. And But to me and um, what I've thought about and, you know, speaking with, with people who are into this uh, functional patterns more so is kind of that – 
yoga is not even really indicative of, of what yoga used to be. And it's more so like the mindfulness is, is consistent and that's probably a good takeaway. And that's why people love it. It's, it's a nice de-stressor, but the, yeah, the stretching for me, it always felt kind of forced. Um, and I wasn't really a fan of that. It, it, it just didn't feel great. And I, I just got so sore whenever I would do yoga quite frequently. And I, it wasn't like, it didn't feel like in a good way either. Um, so that was just my thoughts there. But the myofascial release, yeah, like Ryan's saying, this is really interesting to us because we are kind of diving in on the, the health side of things of, of fascia and how it's this water protein kind of communication matrix, which is so, so fascinating. And, you know, we've only begun to scratch the surface. But I guess how how do you view fascia and like this release of is it tension or how, how does tension come into the play of functional patterns? Because I know this is a foundational thing here that we want to have the right tension in the right places. So maybe you could just shed some light on that. A little. hundred percent. I tell people this as soon as they come in, because there's also body language implications with this as well, you know, in terms of tension and having a good structure. And that's why, you know, there are studies that have, you know, basically implied, right? No one single study is the definitive, you know, answer, but there are studies that have implied that hypermobility uh, will be correlated with anxiety. Um, and if, you know, we would, we, we can probably assume that the inverse would be true, right? If somebody has a better structure and not hypermobility, then perhaps that might be useful for their anxiety, et cetera. So, you know, you, when you talked about yoga, yeah, for sure. I can get anyone to speed up. I can get anyone to work out super hard and pump it and pump out reps and sweat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Getting people to slow down, way harder, way, way harder. So yes, there is definitely something to like, all right, let's turn on some music. Everybody can sit and be quiet and do nothing because we have to, because everyone's being insane. So we need to sit down and stop behaving this way and be quiet and look it within and take a minute here. But outside of that, you know, in terms of like, okay, there's breathing principles, cool. But then it's, it's exactly your, my experience was your experience or your experience was my experience as well with yoga in terms of the stretching. And we talked about those principles, but I just wanted to mention that it isn't what kind of it used to be in terms of like the philosophy. And that is what we're talking about. A lot of that stuff is just kind of like a modern day gymnastic sort of performative stuff rather than, you know, somebody like Iyengar who is like, you know, standing in front of a microphone and breathing in for 40 seconds and then breathing out for 40 seconds like look at you know what i'm saying like and i'm not even saying that that is as relevant as it need as it as it could be but i'm just saying it is definitely different so anyway um but in terms of fascia which is really important and exactly right you are definitely like keying into the thing that matters possibly the most, which is the way we deal with fascia, which the properties of fascia are only so known. And Robert Schleep, I think his name is, um, did a lot of studies on it, but it was yoga oriented. So, but, but what he brought to the table was the fact that the fascia is a neuroendocrine organ. So your and, and that's once again, just a testament that, you know, I just did a live feed on Determined the other day by Robert Sapolsky. And uh, it was it's just confirm, confirming that you are a summation of your neurology, hormones, you know, and your brain, essentially. Right. So if you are the summation of that, every stimulus that you put physically onto your body is going to have either a net positive or a net negative You're right. or, or a neutral. It can be benign. You know, the stimulus can be benign. I've had that where I put people through something and I'm like, how did that feel? And they're like, meh. It's like, well, that's it. I don't look great. I didn't hurt you, but it's not really what we're looking for. We're looking for a profound experience when somebody is going through one of these exercises and more than so in a way we are quote unquote traumatizing the fascia, but in a way that builds resiliency in the same sense that when you wrestle somebody bigger than you, 
right? Not always, but in many instances, right? Kyle Dick talked about this. I was growing, he, say, he says, I was growing up and I continually wrestled people who were bigger and stronger than me. And eventually, you know, here I am, one of the best wrestlers in the world. But then, you know, now, now I'm, that's not enough anymore. Now that I'm in my mid twenties and doing all these cleans and squats and deadlifts, that's not working. You know, here comes functional patterns. And then he was rehab from all those injuries because he was going to retire previously. And then he's gone on to, you know, win Olympic medals, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, but once again, what I'm saying is the point was traumatizing the fascia. You were talking about Carrie B. There is that kind of electrical component to it and, and the hydration component to it. So what we're saying is that when you have a structure that is closer to an athletic structure, such as a Floyd Mayweather, Barry Sanders, Sidney McLaughlin, LeBron James. I mean, I think it's safe to assume that these guys have a certain level of resiliency, right? So that's why it's like, well, what is the reference point in real life? It is not in a textbook. It is these guys. It is these people moving in this way. When we see that, that is hydrated, slingy, whippy, all the properties of fascia that we've come to know, that is it in action, right? There is no other properties of fascia don't exist in isolation. So it's like, oh, that guy's really bendy, but then this guy can lift a lot, but then this guy can do this. It's like, well, Barry Sanders can you know, score touchdowns and dunk a basketball. And the reason that is is because – those two things are kind of the same thing in a way because they're derivatives of each other. So I was just going to ask quickly, is that like why are, is that just a genetic gift that these folks have um, because of their heritage or what have you? Um, maybe, you know, European folks, not as much because we didn't need this and we had more industrialization sooner. Um, what well, I guess, yeah, what's, what's the thought there? And then what is the best way to build that back up? Is it through functional patterns training? Sure. Yeah, no, I believe that. And then yes, it is partly like, yes, it's like, oh, you know, I hopefully I mature audiences only. It's like, yes, you know, okay. Everyone that I named is like of African-American descent. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, that we're not, we can, we can put on our, you know, our, we can take off our woke caps and be like, yeah, we can recognize that and I'll be cool with it. You know what no I'm saying? No problem right. here. Yeah. For, you for get that. it. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. So, but yes, I think, yes, it is a genetic predisposition. And then of course, epigenetics have a lot to do with it, but that still, you can't separate genetics and epigenetics when it comes to your ancestry, because the way that your genes express depended on your environment and your culture and et cetera, et cetera. So it's like when we study the Maasai, you know, the Maasai will probably be more athletic, you know, just inherently than any real like European person that you pull out of wherever, right. Or even in the United States. So, 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 yes, there is a genetic predisposition. We're very interested in the epigenetic aspects of exercise, which is once again why you want to be careful with the type of stimulus that you put on people because everybody have the has these incredible ranges of sensitivity as well as ranges of epigenetic experiences that came before which is what Robert Sapolsky talks about in his book. So I would highly recommend taking a look at that just to the audience if you haven't, because it really strings together a lot of the stuff from why zebras don't get ulcers, behaviorism, you know, why people behave the way they do and why it can be hard for people to structure their environment in a way that produces a better result for themselves, right? An optimal result, which would lead to sustainable health, good relationships, right? A good relationship with their environment, lower anxiety, right? Um, because that, so anyway, um, not to get too off track, but um, what, what was the point that I was going with before that? You asked me a question. Just epigenetics and that's in right, general. the genetics. Yeah. That's yeah, what it was. Yeah. So just to close that out, 
Yes. The answer is yes. The the genetic predisposition, just quickly, this, this brings me to a really important point when it comes to functional patterns. I think the reason why it's growing so much is because we're really focused on general pop. Even though we're saying, hey, we want to move like the best athletes, we don't, we don't seek out athletes to go train them or whatever the case may be. Our goal is in the long term to turn to turn your 43 year old desk jockey into a Barry Sanders over the course of generations, probably is how that stimulus would have to. But the more effective that you are in and efficient with giving that stimulus, the faster that it happens, the faster that you can move the needle. So that so that is why we tell people to and Carrie B has good information on this. I liked her recent post about vitamin D versus melatonin and why you don't necessarily need to supplement in the winter i thought that's what i'm saying man there's so much yeah. stuff yet to be known and uh i think that relationship to your to your biochemistry all that stuff matters um but if you get the mechanics down you will still get results because fascia is so powerful it's like lebron isn't like lebron's not like oh yeah let me make sure i have my blue blockers on at night you know what i'm saying like he probably doesn't care about that at that moment much he's not outside in the morning getting 10 minutes of sun in his eyes you know what i'm saying like it would benefit him if he did it would be great yeah. if he did but i'm just saying that that's not is the, that's not the determining factor as important as it is his like starting point is so much higher that's you got why it. like it's it's insane it's so cool to think about this because i look at like other you know, civilizations like just native americans i mean obviously mm -hmm. m way more recently brought to industrialization modernization and you know the stories of them just running as fast as bison you know perfect skin perfect health and yeah now we're just so disconnected across the board i i just had to say that but it's it's really fascinating and, that, and that's cool i that um you're looking into like the health side of things as well with like what carrie's posting because it's all it's all connected so i think this really fits perfectly with what we've been talking about recently but i'll, I'll let ryan chime in as well yeah no i mean all i was gonna say is that it's really fascinating because like you find all these uh facets of health whether it's fitness like uh, nutrition, whatever, they're all really like interlinked. And I think that's when you have to like really pull yourself back and like look at them all from 30,000 foot view because it, it is all connected. Like I've been really fascinated with fascia for a long time, not really from like uh, the, the zone of how we've been looking at on the podcast recently, but it's been an issue of mine since I had anorexia like 10 years ago um, where I, it really caused a lot of like damage and stress on my own fascial tissue. And so like a lot of my time has been spent trying to figure out, okay, how can I improve my fascia with movement and stuff like that? And I know I'm breaking up cause I can see your faces stop. So I'm just continuing it, talking. It, yeah. go, I just go, continue go, yeah. talking cause I know the recording nice. is fine. But, yes, yes, yes. But no, what I was saying is like, um, it's, we've kind of answered this question a couple times, but it, uh, it's sort of a two part where it leads into the other part. It's like, how can we one assess, assess, our current state of like fascial health and then what are some like initial steps we can take beyond sort of like the, the other things like nutrition, stuff like that to like really begin to work our fascia into an optimal way so that it can be um, more primed for performance. And a lot of that is like through what you guys do with movement. So I sort of love to talk about like how those movements impact the fascia, make everything work more fluidly um, and sure. stuff like that. Because I mean, Everyone talks about jo like joint pain is very prevalent in modern society, but I don't think people understand how this affects the joint itself. And they're, I think they're looking at it too myopically as it's not the joint that's the problem per se. It's not, it may not even be necessarily the muscle per se, but it's all these things interworkingly together that then is manifesting at the end point, which is the pain, but it never started there. 100%. That whatever pain that you have is a culmination of everything that came before it. No question about it. It is a culmination of any act. It's a culmination of the steps that you've taken, the workouts that you've done, the times that you've been on your feet for a period of time, the times that you've sat, et cetera, et cetera. It is everything. No question about it. So when it comes to the... Um, like, okay, you were asking, like, how do we assess fascia? 
here's an interesting couple interesting things. One, David Sinclair has talked about you can look at someone and kind of have most like, for example, I think I think it may have been a study, but he mentioned that you could put photos of someone in front of people and they will recognize they will guess how old that person is with incredible accuracy, right? They're, they're within a five year span of like how old that person is just by looking at them, right? So some people, they, they, they lose their objective reference point, you know, of what being healthy is because either, because, because people are uncomfortable with setting a standard, Right. So they're just because the fitness novelty machine will just say, hey, just do what works for you. You know what I'm saying? Do you know if, if yoga, you like yoga, just do it. If you like deadlifting and powerlifting and that's your sport, just do it. Never mind the fact that the person that just threw their back out has a rib cage and hip shift that's like, you know, however, however far. And then or that the person that's done all this yoga is like kind of a floppy mess. You know what I'm saying? Like they won't take that into consideration. Like you'd be surprised. Actually, there was even a study that was done on patellar tendon uh, tendinopathy, patellar tendinopathy. And they were saying that uh, through a gait cycle assessment, it what you could show a layman, a person who does have knee pain and a person who doesn't have knee pain and have them run, and the person could pick out who has knee pain. You know what I'm saying? So you can be intuitive with these things, but if you don't have any first principles, this is why we kind of talk about, you know, and, and once again, I, I don't know your guys' opinion on this, and that's fine. I know we can, even if he, it was a difference of opinion, I know that's not a big deal for you guys, but we talk about kind of the spiritualist stuff and blah, 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 and that's why we talk about tyranny of words and abstractions, because when people think in an abstract way, if I say certain words like love or democracy or communism or this, if we have to agree Upon, we have to have reference points about what those words mean, right? So the same thing. We have to have a reference point for what a healthy person even is. And then from there, we can say, okay, what are the properties of fascia? In other words, the way a person, the way a person functions that would be deemed to be healthy, right? Can they, can they move rotationally without pain? Can they walk without pain? Can they sprint without pain? Can they, can they play... You know, martial arts is a really good place to start. So, like, when people do martial arts, a lot of times they start with jujitsu, and I just would absolutely not recommend that. I would start with boxing. I would start with boxing first. People, because boxing is standing, you're throwing punches, right? I mean, if you have pain, like, you should work on, you should do the 10-week course. If you can see a practitioner, you should see a practitioner first. You should do, you should do the functional training system. But, like, people start with jujitsu, and I'm like, well... Yeah, it's on the floor. It's like eventually you can, of course, of course, absolutely. But there's, it's like that's not the optimal way to start for – I mean I've had like 37-year-old women who decided to do it out of nowhere with no prior conditioning and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like that is just not where you want to go next, you know. So so <laughs> it's, just, it's just funny. So that's the thing. It's like there are some kind of like once you have first principles, there's some common sense – actions and assessments and ways of looking at it that'll be like okay yeah yeah this this i feel lighter right buck mr fuller i'll i'll cut it after this but buck mr fuller said um you want pools of compression over a sea of decompression right and that means that you know even though we're using tension to improve your structure you should feel better, lighter, less compressed because of it. Are you interested in 100% grass-fed, grass-finished bison meat? I'm excited to be a partner with Falls Family Ranches. Based in Wyoming, Falls Family Ranches is raising high-quality bison meat the way nature intended. As a native large ruminant of North America, bison is one of the most nutrient-dense foods you can consume. If you're interested in trying out their bison boxes, Use code TRISTAN, T-R-I-S-T-A-N, 10, for 10% off your first order. That's actually, before Tristan jumps in, I, I wanted to make just like a quick, just 
piggyback off one thing you said way, way earlier because it, it made me think of it again was sure. that a lot of people will go and I'm sure all three of us are guilty of this too is like a lot of us are so focused on what we can add that we're not looking at maybe we need to take the, a step back and I'm definitely guilty of that over and over I mean probably still guilty of it um, but it's one of those things where it's like how can you decide what like how well you're going to move in this situation if you don't even know how your own body moves and and 99.9 percent of us have no idea um and that's why we'll hire trainers we'll do all these things because we 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 don't know how to make that assessment um and even those people probably don't even in a conventional setting probably don't know how to make that assessment so sometimes it is about assessment and taking a step back and really visualizing uh before you just start like you said, doing jujitsu. Cause like that, that's such a good point. Cause like, I think a lot of people see where people are at that end point in their, in their goal where they're doing like the high level stuff now. Yes. But me and Tristan will talk about this a lot, especially with like his concussion recovery. It's like, well, he had a whole year where he didn't work, couldn't work out at all. So it's like, he didn't start just like running up mountains and climbing Mount hood and all this crazy stuff. Like that's years in the making of, of doing things. And so it's really easy to see that and then get lost in the, in the fluff. Yeah. It's easy to want to just jump back into things. Um, mm. But yeah, I like what you're saying. That makes a lot of sense because what is health, you know, today? Um, it's the standard, the average state of health is extremely poor. Um, does that mean that's what health is? No. Um, right. Actually, not even close. Right. So yeah, it's it's everything's been watered down, diluted and, you know, just yeah, the the feel good nonsense that's been paraded, but you do have to be realistic with your goals and I think that's important here and that's kind of what you're getting at which I completely align with and at the end of the day, yeah, how many people are like extremely functional, have great fascial health like across the board, great health almost no one. So you have to just take your spectrum, I guess, and understand where, where you are right now and, and where do you want to get to. But I think that's great advice as well. Just being careful because I personally like, you know, getting into things like jujitsu and more just intense full body exor exercises. Like that's, I think that's great advice is kind of just understand where you're at, like take an honest assessment of yourself and, and do something in the functional patterns realm, but yeah, I, you know, how does this coincide with athletics in, in general, I guess, you know, it, are athletics a problem? You know, I played soccer my whole life in college and, you know, I, you know, people like my mom's generation, they'll always say, Oh, you, you know, that's going to ruin your knees and all your joints. Like are modern athletics a huge problem uh, in the, realm and the perspective of, of functional patterns are some better than others i'm assuming like you know throwing javelin and, and shot puts probably better than playing basketball on artificial surfaces but i'm curious to hear your take uh, for sure and that and that is a good point and that's another thing when it comes to kind of a first principles perspective there are kind of like pros and cons to everything right nothing no i mean sports sports were created with the intuition that we were that we're attracted to the to what are known as the most popular sports such as soccer basketball baseball because they all include a ball they all include some form of throwing they all include some form of running and our evolutionary biology is in tune with that so it's like oh here's a ball we can all do the way that we've evol evolutionary evolved to move anyway we're all just opting for that right and then the lebron james and the barry sanders they just get the pick of the litter and they dod the bo jacksons they dominate because their epigenetic expression just responds to you put a ball in front of them and they're just monsters, right? Then on top of that, put them in a controlled environment, practicing with other humans and then building it up. And then that epigenetic response, they'll survive a lot, but they'll still thrive with that and become absolute monsters. But for everybody else that aren't, that isn't, you know, 
a biomechanical trust fund baby is what we call them, or if you are not hopped up on a lot of exogenous substances, which is another big problem, um, not just in professional sports, but particularly with the fitness novelty machine. The fitness novelty machine more so because you don't really know. It will, you know, Liver King is the prime example, right? You know, and the, whatever. It's not. I mean, you know, you'd have to be pretty um, naive to think that you know, that he wasn't when he said he wasn't, you know, so whatever, it's not a big deal for me, but it's just saying, I'm just saying it's either that, or you have the genes that you are succeeding despite how you train as opposed to because of it, which is a big thing with people when they, when they see the way that athletes train and that we'll get that with functional patterns, they'll be like, well, oh, just, you know, all the most famous athletes and best movers and blah, blah, blah. They still stretch. They still deadlift. They still squat, which a lot of them actually don't stretch as much they're not really squatting and deadlifting as much anymore and a lot of them are opting for more transverse stuff and i would i would like to think that functional patterns had something to do with that and of course there were people that intuitively probably were like hey uh this guy looks a little bit slower after he does all this heavy barbell squatting and everything probably shouldn't be doing that three times a week you know what i'm saying so you know you have to be a rocket scientist but anyway athletics when it comes to athletics like yes there are pros and cons and yes there are athletics that are better than others and to, to answer your question more specifically like you know that's why i mentioned like boxing for example so like functional patterns functional patterns mixes well with all sports um it, it mixes particularly well with boxing and wrestling because boxing and wrestling you're not it actually it doesn't have a ball and it doesn't you just have like another human in front of you and then so there there is you will build asymmetries by doing wrestling wrestling and boxing a particular way but there are ways to address those asymmetries that work well with functional patterns that are a little bit more straightforward than like, okay, I'm going to fix up this soccer player, baseball or basketball player, baseball player, tennis player that all involve like a racket or a ball or something like that. Right. So, so we do have, when we do our movement elimination protocol, initially we do include kind of athletics in, in the mix, specifically if they have chronic pain. It depends on if they, if you're playing once a week and you're doing functional patterns with a practitioner twice a week and and doing myofascial release and you're very disciplined with like working on your dysfunctions and you're building that awareness, more than likely, you know, doing soccer once a week, doing basketball, you should be able to do that. However, there are, but, but if, but like, you know, if you don't have any like awareness of where you're at when you're standing, even if you play basketball well, should you really be do putting in those neuromuscular inputs over and over and over again when you don't even have the awareness of where your body is in space when you're just standing? You know, probably not. So here's the thing. If you have some sort of massive foundation in soccer or basketball, whatever the case may be, then you could take a literally six-month break. I'm not even kidding. You could take a six-month break and then do a lot of functional patterns and then go back to basketball and probably feel a lot better and probably perform better. And athletes do this already, right? When they get injured, they greatly reduce their output. And then all of a sudden, either, either a trainer threw some, you know, SHIT against the wall and it stuck and they kind of got lucky with an intervention. And then that athlete is kind of back or the, that athlete is resilient and the, because they took a break and they regenerated and focused on themselves, their mentality, their health, their health, then they were able to come back and have a greater output than previously, right? They, they focus somewhat on their mechanics and then, now, and then now they're doing better. So people get, this is kind of back to the yoga point, People get very, very scared about taking a break from what they're currently doing. And it's just what you guys said. I actually did want to speak on that because you keyed into something extremely important, which I always think it's funny because the yoga people seem to talk about this quite a bit. But then when we say do a movement elimination protocol, they get very weird about that, which is it is not just about adding to what you're doing. That's not what architects do. Architects aren't like, hey, we're just going to add this structure here in the middle of the room for no reason because we just want to add something. Where everything's, everything in architecture, the physics that built this building serve a purpose, right? So that's why it's like 
Yes, like athletics, there's problems, but functional patterns does hook up well with athletics. That's why people like Kyle Dake have had such great success. Johnny Eblen just had his second world title defense, um, and he's he's doing very well. Um, and that's why. But but you know, we don't like I said, we don't seek out athletes. So I know people are kind of waiting for like when we're training an NBA team or something like that. That I'm sure will happen eventually. But but we don't seek that out because we don't want any celebrity fit bumps jo- johnny eblin is doing functional patterns because he believes in it and is doing the right thing and knows that he's setting an example and he knows how important it is for his performance you know what i'm saying he's not we're not training him in hopes that he becomes some big fighting star and then finally we get our our you know li- our, our time in the limelight as functional patterns practitioners that's not why we do it you know what i mean so that's always and we don't want to compromise and say yeah we're gonna especially team sports there's a lot of like you know strength and conditioning coaches will be like oh well yeah you can do the functional pattern stuff but you also still have to squat and deadlift and blah 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 it's like well we're not doing that so forget it um but yes but yes athletics that that is like what the problem with athletics more so than even just doing it it really depends on the individual no i think it's a really good point actually got me thinking um about just injury reoccurrence in like really high performance athletes. Like uh, football comes top of mind just cause that's the season right now. But um, you, you'll see people that are like high performers, but they'll chronically re injure like their ankle or like some part of their leg or something like that. Like speaking about football specifically. Um, and it'll happen like every season almost without a fail. And then they'll either push through it or they'll be out and then they'll recover um, but they're not actually looking at, like you said, in my mind, probably the, the functionality of why that's occurring in the first place. And they're addressing only like the ankle or, or whatever like that. So it's super fascinating because we had a discussion a little bit about this with rounded athlete, just about injury reoccurrence and stuff like that. And of course that was, uh, that con that constitution was around rounding and various things like that. But, um, it, it is interesting to, to think about just like these chains that we create. And like you just said, sometimes it's like, we're also afraid of stopping what we're doing to try something else to put something on the wayside to address a problem. But it's, it's like you said, if you're continually do the same stimulus, you're, you're backing the same patterns that break the the system. And and same goes for like mindset work too. It's like, you got to break the neuro, like create neuroplasticity, right? So you're, you're trying to break a pattern and create a new neuro connection. And that goes with like movement as well. And so what is about, what is it about um, this functional movement that sort of like in your mind completes that puzzle for, for maybe you from your own personal philosophy? Totally, totally. And so I will tell you guys, actually, I, so it's funny that you brought up athletics because I am somebody and this kind of comes into, you know, I don't want to get too, uh, you know, abstract per se, but we're all we're all men here. So when I look at it, I, I struggled as a man, not having played team sports. And it was something where I was like, I noticed that the guys who had played team sports had different relationships with other men and the way that they uh, asserted themselves in the world, right? And I guess, you know, I'm saying, oh, as a man and blah, blah, blah. So I I sort of take that back. What I'm saying is, there's there's not really anybody who's like, oh, I don't I don't want to be the popular jock that, you know, looks really good and plays every sport really well and gets a lot of validation, especially these athletes. I mean, good Lord, you know, right. Millions of dollars and the most validation that any human could ever have. Right. Um, so there's nobody who doesn't want that. Right. I, I say as a man, but there's no human that's like, yeah, no, I don't want to be validated for something like that in terms of like how and because that's part of health, too. Right. It's flexible your health you know it's like that's why I have a certain level of muscle tone and blah 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 like I get that but anyway back to kind of the team sports thing it's like you know when you develop when you get into team sports and you look at what these guys are doing and that's that's part of why they're afraid to stop what they're doing Um, for myself as someone who didn't play them 
I only did the deadlifting and squatting and the bench pressing and stuff like that. So I was just kind of wrapped up in my little hole in the gym. And then that's what that's what that was my point. I kind of lost my train of thought there is that that's why that I was interested in the team sports stuff, but not until much later, because I thought I was like, ah, all those guys that do the team sports, they're running a lot and they're skinny and they do the cardio and like I'm like muscular and whatever. And like that's and that was the thing. So I was like, OK. But then I played a game of basketball in my early 20s when I hadn't really played and I had severe back pain. And I was like, okay, well, why is that? This guy hasn't done anything in the gym, but I have pain. My dad was a sports phenom, right? He could play any sport and he was a monster at soccer. Never had any lower back pain, never had any problems, you know. He's in his 60s and can still play a game of basketball with me and a couple of buddies, right? So it's like, wait, what is that? If I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing, why am I having pain? And so... What it came down to is after my I, I injured myself deadlifting, and after that I really started to wonder, you know, why don't I feel athletic, you know, in comparison to people who have done other sports and stuff like that? Why is that? So it was like, okay, so now relative to me at 35, I'm actually learning how to play basketball and play pretty well and against kids that are in their 20s. Relative to me, that's insane. Right. I mean, a year ago, I wouldn't have thought that I could dribble a basketball in between my legs. Right. At all. Like I, there was no chance. I, it's serious. Like, yeah, like very, very, very bad, very bad. Humiliating. I would say it would be humiliating. That's how bad I was. Um, and now I can do it. And it's like, whoa. And I can do a pickup game and understand what's going on and get that position and blah, blah, blah. And it's like so when it comes to. Like I just mentioned that because that's my personal journey. Functional patterns gave me the reference point of weight transfer, three-dimensional movement, being able to have real intra-abdominal pressure, how those ro- how the way that you rotate it affects how you jump, how you throw, how you pass a basketball, how you swing a tennis racket, right? So – You want to be – it's like a balance between getting caught up in the glory of like, whoa, I can finally do this and, okay, not so fast. There are still limitations where you really need to focus on that. And that's really what I wanted to get to. I don't need to play basketball four days a week to get good at 35. I can literally play maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks, focus on my – sustainable biomechanics and improve and that should be a cause for celebration and instead people kind of like oh you know man all i want to do is like do something do something do something you know what i'm saying so that and you know and athletes will get that too but you know more to the point i just wanted to mention kind of my personal struggle with that and how functional this is why i'm sort of an evangelist for this company is because it changed my life it changed the way that i think it changed the way with how i relate with the world because if you once again the gate mechanics lead to downstream effects in terms of body language, right? We were talking about fascia. Robert Schleep, I'm sure, talks about body language. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, imagine the body language of a Floyd Mayweather, right? When Floyd Mayweather walks into a room, it's probably pretty assertive, right? There's probably a level of self-confidence there that many, 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 many people wish they had. And part of that probably has to do with the way that he is in touch with his body in a very real, real mechanical, fundamental sense. Um, so, so when it comes to athletes re-injuring themselves, I just want to say that that really shouldn't be happening because if you gave me a Jimmy Butler – You know, I've seen some of, I don't know, the context of every single thing he's doing, but I know that he's had knee pain and stuff like that. Anthony Davis, right, has it all, he's, you know, known for getting injured again and again and again and again and again. If you gave me one of these guys, I probably could make it so that they get injured less right now. You know what I'm saying? Just as, and I don't even proclaim to be the best practitioner, the best trainer, the best whatever, right? You know, that's an Audi. You know, and I can just say that I don't care if people think I'm drinking the Kool-Aid or whatever. The guy has a track record. That's why I say that I'm. But but 
just with what I know right now, that should not be happening. And people will say it's because these guys are faster than ever before. They're jumping higher than ever before. They're playing harder than ever before. And I just think that's mostly a cop out. I think that's something like basketball. Yes, it's incredibly athletic. But, you know, these guys aren't going through insane levels of knee flexion or anything like that. Like, yes, when they're jumping. But even when they're jumping, a lot of times they're getting a quick ground reaction for success. You know what I'm saying? So I just feel like the injury prevention thing, these guys should not be getting injured over and over again. And if they took a step back and were really able to say, hey, how am I moving? How does this relate to how I stand and walk? How does it relate to how I sprint? How does how I play basketball relate to how I do a 40 meter full sprint or a 100 meter full sprint? And then I would get much better results with my training and I wouldn't get injured as often. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on with pretty much everything you just said. And and as someone who did play, you know, sports pretty much all the time from when I was like four to 21, um, that to me is it was something just incredible. And you you take it for granted in the moment that you're just doing this so often, so often. And then all of a sudden you stop for like a year when I was like concussed and then you try and get back into it. And it's like, whoa, everything is lost neural proprioception is, is gone. Um, and then, yeah, the biomechanics is, is not there. Um, the movements are, but, but yeah, just that, that consistency. And for me, sports is always like, that's how I viewed just someone can walk up, play anything on the moment, you know, not, you know, they don't, the best athletes, they don't need to warm up or anything. You know, they just show up and ball out. And that's like, to me, it's just that display of being able to do that is like peak, you know, human achievement in the physical sense. And I, I think that's what people should strive to do. And it's something I've been yearning for and I've kind of gotten back to a place. Um, but I agree. It's like this, it, these injury rates are, are, are not normal. They might be common, but they're not normal. And whether that be, you know, people just doing everything wrong in, in terms of fascial health and, and movements, but then also in terms, yeah, just the environment across the board has never been more, I guess, unnatural um, 100%. per se. And uh, I, I, I think it makes sense. So, you know, 100 years ago, people, they were they're running and sprinting and doing sports and things. And I, I don't think they were getting um, injured at this rate. And, yeah, we are bigger, faster, stronger. But are we compared to some other populations like – Maybe not in the modern world. I, I don't know. Um, nobody knows, really. So it, it's interesting to, to think about that. But I guess in general, you said, you know, you're not a huge fan or functional patterns is a huge fan of running or, or any like chronic cardio. You know, how, how do you see this all, I guess, blend into, you know, just what an everyday person could kind of do um, and what they should prioritize. I know you mentioned the course and everything like that, or is there any, you know, just fundamental at home stuff? Like it's better to swing a barbell around instead of just lift it in one planar direction. I guess some, some basic at home tips for, for people who may a have chronic pain or b just trying to prevent chronic pain and, and have longevity in their movement routine. Sure. You know, it's idiosyncratic to the person, but yeah, no, a hundred percent. Yeah. You know, everything you said, I totally understand. Um, it, 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 just real quick, that is definitely injury normalization is what uh, we were talking about. We did the response to Lane Norton. We, he was giving his laundry list of injuries. Oh, yeah, that's actually, I think that's where you actually commented, Tristan. And, yeah, so, you know, okay, that's injury normalization, and we have to Lane be Norton's, that. Uh, yeah, he's a character for many reasons. Oh, 100%. Okay. And, you know, he's easy to kind of talk about. We knew that he would kind of escalate and stuff like that, too. So it is what it is. But, you know, um, so, but outside of that, you know, your typical desk jockey, what I would say is, you know, don't stretch. Don't. I know I'm giving a list of don'ts. I'll do a do's too, but don't. Don't stretch. 
don't eat vegan. I'm sure you guys talk about that all the time. Don't do yes. that. Oh my do God. That. You know, like, and it's a good hook too, you know, cause we're like, you know, don't eat healthy, right? What people think is healthy is like, don't do that. You know? And then people are like, what do you mean? Right? Don't stretch. Don't eat healthy. Don't, um, you know, don't follow workouts on YouTube. You know, I really would say, here's what I'll say. I've never regretted, I know, and I know if people can be in a certain situation, which is why we have low-cost options such as the 10-week course, et cetera, et cetera, I have never regretted just paying someone who knows what they're talking about to tell me what to do. I have not once, even if it's like, because so many people are ready to just be like, it's a scam, I don't want to buy in, it costs this and blah, blah, blah. And really, I ne- you know, I know I've been on the other side of the fence where I didn't have that much to offer the world and I had to just pay for people to give me knowledge and blah, blah, blah. So I get it. There are scams out there and stuff like that. However, I don't think there's been one thing that I paid for that I haven't learned something from. You know what I mean? Something, even if it is what not to do, you know. So what I would recommend is. If there is a practitioner near near you and you have chronic pain, I would recommend that. If you just want, if if you just have some some stuff going on, just doing the ten week course and learning about the myofascial release, it's just it's the first four weeks. I mean, it's a game changer for people. It's a game changer. So instead of stretching, do the myofascial release. Um, You know, watch out for, watch out for trying all these different things instead of adding subtract right when it comes to your life instead of adding subtract do what these which i'm sure you guys already talk about on your podcast i do wish like before people even set foot in my studio i do wish that okay you've been getting the appropriate amount of b vitamins from me you've been hydrating yourself appropriately and getting minerals and stuff such as magnesium etc you have figured out your sleep game, which your biomechanics might be a part of the sleep game, you know? So it is, you kind of have to do everything at the same time, but, but I, but you've dealt with your anxiety a little bit, right? You're doing heart math or some sort of HRV training, right? You are, you are doing a movement elimination program protocol where you just stop, right? I would say, you know, what can your average show do? Just stop, 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 stop. Take it easy, Think about what you need to do and then kind of go from there and 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 start on the 10 week course because this is the future of training. I tell everybody who comes into the studio, it's the future of training. You may as well get on board now because this is this is the elephant in the room. This is the thing that people are not that are just now starting to talk about that is going to absolutely take over in the future. It's crazy. Um, so, yeah, so I would just say for your average Joe. You know, don't stretch, do myofascial release, start with that, work on your interoception, work on visualizing where you are in space, right? That type of proprioceptive stuff, you can't beat it, you know, practice, you know, non-sleep deep rest, right? That kind of stuff is really important too. Everyone is too wired, right? And that can definitely relate to your fascia getting too, too, too intense, you know, get outside. Oh my God, get out side stop being inside so much you know what i'm saying things like that that's really the low-hanging fruit yeah i think that's the great last thing i'll say is um i really had fun in this discussion um but yeah it's people really like to and i was like this too for a very very long time and i and i i remind myself of it when i work with new clients and stuff is like everyone's looking to add something but no one's really thinking like what can i take away because everyone's like, oh, what's, what supplement do I need to take now? Or I was like, well, probably won't do shit till you get fundamentals down and all that stuff. So, but no, what you said too is like, I liked what you said about standing in space. You can you can feel imbalance when you're just, like, just stand barefoot on a flat surface and you'll feel mm-hmm. like the difference between your ankles. Like you'll feel some internal rotation. It, it's crazy if you just like stand, close your eyes, if you can manage the balance and you'll, you'll feel it. You'll start to feel where your deficits are. It's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
I think we need to stop, yeah, normalizing the degradation of humanity um, across the board. I mean, what something that's always an example of like strength and maybe more functional is just like farmers and, and doing work like on the land. And we're talking about, I'm reading this book, Alexander the Great um, earlier. And, you know, these men are doing work into their 50s. I mean, some if they were alive. They were fighting in their 50s and 60s. You know, you shouldn't just be expecting to degrade. You shouldn't. This is not normal. And like you're saying, I think it's profound that, yeah, you're in your mid-30s. You're learning how to play basketball because you have rebuilt this foundation. And, yeah, for for me, that's something. I've, I've really been looking for something like this. I thought – um, like I did a lot of this knees over toes stuff a couple years back. I thought it was decent, you know, got me back to getting in the game, bit different mindset, but I felt like there is more that could have been there. And I think functional patterns for, for me is it. The gym was just nice for a while because like I couldn't lift for so long cause I was injured and you know, it's a confidence booster to like move around some weight as a man. But you know, like I said, the peak, measure to me of you know male or female athleticism whatever just peak human output from a physical standpoint is is doing some sort of sport and i think what you mentioned across the board getting that alignment of everything's operating in sync like in a moment's notice if you're shooting basketball or playing a soccer ball the amount of synchronicity you need to have in your your muscles in your neural communication your positioning uh, everything that that is key, and I've kind of realized that I, I feel like as my health has improved, I actually have gotten better at that, and I think that comes back to the fascial health and health. 100%. And like you're saying, you know, doing all the other things in terms of health will only help charge that up even more. But I'm just looking at this 10 week program too. It's only like 200 bucks. I mean, come on, people. Like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I'm I saying. thought it's gonna be like a thousand dollars or something. No that chance. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> that's a cheap. pretty. You know, that investment is is totally worth it. I'm actually gonna be doing some in person FP sessions starting. I think the week after next. Very I'm, cool. I'm I'm stoked to try it out. Um, and yeah, see kind of where this puts me in terms of athleticism because I feel like I have a lot to to offer still. But Mike, man, this has been a pleasure. You've been an absolute riot. I love your mindset on on everything. If I'm ever in SoCal, I will have to let you know for sure. Please, I please. will definitely drop in. I will recommend you to all my my LA friends as well. I think appreciate really that, dude. Appreciate. It. How do we get is how do we get outdoors and FP? um kind of all together tied in like is can we get like an outdoor studio or, or something like that is I that a, is that a pr- figuring principle? that out yeah because yeah, i figuring see a lot of out. like barefoot in these pictures some is outdoors and i feel like that really that marriage is 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 right it's very it's good and all that all that stuff we you can do all the dynamic stuff outdoors like yeah, a lot of yeah. people like i used to just copy dynamics off of youtube before i even really knew who they were and i would just be copying their stuff but i would be outside either in the park or on the beach the kyle dake video is on the beach where he's doing nice. all that stuff you know so yes all that and and you know it, it, it's a long term goal to create you know the pulley machines that can sustain. Although they can kind of sustain some outdoor stuff right now. Well, one of the SoCal guys that bought a machine told me that his machine held up very well over the course of when it rained this past mm. uh, winter, and actually it was like completely fine. I'm sure it couldn't do that maybe over the course of a decade, but you know there there you know, especially in comparison to traditional gym culture, functional pattern is very accessible to do outdoors that's why you see when people are swinging like the pair ball and stuff yeah, like that yeah. all that's outdoors you know so a lot of those tools you just take i tell all my clients like hey you take this mace bell outside extra credit take it outside oh, yeah. go to the park get out on the beach and you get extra extra credit for that amazing i love it well mike where can people find you and find out more about functional patterns i appreciate that definitely check out the functional patterns there's a couple things. The functional go to functionalpatterns.com to check out the uh, 10 week course. That's definitely like number one on the list if you don't have a practitioner near you or even if you do a lot of our clients buy the 10 week course in order to work alongside of working with a practitioner. Um, 
then also check out their Instagram. There's tons of results on Instagram with like longer form testimonials talking about where this person came from. If you have some sort of chronic issue, I guarantee you'll find somebody on the main page that has gone through the same thing that you have and gotten good results. Um, then uh, also check out um, fp.santa monica. Um, that is our Instagram page for Functional Patterns Santa Monica. Also, my Instagram page is mike.musiolo. That is M I K E dot M U C C I O L O. Um, so follow me if you want to. If you want, if you're into the like the tyranny of words stuff, Robert Sapolsky, Jacques Fresco, that kind of stuff. You know, I do I do that stuff here and there. That's kind of what I bring to the table outside of you know posting all sorts of cool things functional patterns related. Um, but yeah, that's how that's how you're going to get the most out of uh, finding out more about FP. Love it, man. Well, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. This is really exciting conversation. And thanks uh, for having yeah. me on. Thanks everybody for for tuning in to another yeah. episode of Decentralized Radio. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.